on this park house. I'm going to close that door behind you just so we can keep our AC in and the heat and humidity out. Built in 1772, this is the side that's here and in use as a field hospital in the aftermath of the Battle of Princeton, which you're going to learn about uh, in just a few minutes. Our most famous patient was Brigadier General Hugh Mercer. Mercer, during the course of the battle, as you are about to learn, is bayoneted seven times in the abdomen and beaten over the head with the butt of a musket. He's left for dead. Uh, and you're going to learn all about how that happened to him out there on the field. But this is a bayonet. 16 inches of good British steel that affixes to the end of the musket that Bob's going to talk to you about outside. There is a reason this kind of bayonet is no longer used. In fact, it's been banned for use in warfare. The reason is its triangular shape. Any thoughts why? You can't stitch it back together. You can't stitch it back together. Mercer has seven of these wounds in him. Now, Mercer will stay with us for nine days. Uh, that's a long time to be you know, punched like a pincushion, and he languishes during his time here. That said, Mercer has a rather busy last nine days. He sees uh, no more than three rather famous historical individuals. Among them are Washington's nephew, who will be the last man to allegedly see Mercer alive, General Charles Cornwallis, who you're going to learn a lot more about outside, uh, who issues Mercer's parole here after the battle, and his attending physician, Dr. Benjamin Rush. Mm -hmm. Now, if that name rings a bell, and it should, He's one of the most prominent doctors of the 18th century, so famous that if there had never been an American Revolution, he's probably somebody we would still know and study. Now, Rush is acting at this moment in his capacity as the chief surgeon of the Continental Army. In his spare time, he's a member of the Continental Congress and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Cool gig. Rush will attend Mercer, as well as the other uh, individuals we'll mention here in just a few moments in the house. Two days before Mercer dies, Rush will leave, and when he does, he pens a letter to George Washington and to Richard Henry Lee, another member of the Continental Congress, the Virginia House of Burgesses, and a close friend of General Mercer. In that letter, he writes that he believes Mercer is going to survive. A man who has been bayoneted seven times in the abdomen is going to live. That's a pretty brazen claim, if I say so myself, but there might be a few reasons that Rush says this, and this is, of course, determining that Rush is as good as a doctor as everybody says he is. This battle, as you will come to know, takes place in the middle of winter. Our temperature clocks in on the morning of January 3rd at somewhere between 20 to 24 degrees Fahrenheit, which means that Mercer is probably wearing as many layers of clothing as he has with him, his undershirt, his overshirt, his waistcoat, his jacket, and probably some sort of cape or overcoat as well. If you've ever tried to stab somebody, and if you have, no shame, <laughs> it's a difficult thing to do, even with an implement like this. Uh, so it is entirely possible that the wounds that Mercer receives during the battle may have only been about skin deep. That said, any puncture wound in the 18th century could be considered a death sentence because of the number one killer of men in the 18th century, and that is bacteria. bacteria, infection, sepsis. So, the fact that Rush says that he thinks Mercer is going to survive makes that an even more brazen claim. Now, two days later, Mercer will die. When he does, Rush won't even mention the bayonet wounds he receives. Instead, he blames it on the blow he receives to the head, citing a cerebral hemorrhage as the reason for Mercer's death. Now, whether or not that's the case is hard to determine. We only have what primary sources we have to go on to evaluate Mercer's mental condition during his nine-day period where he was still alive. But in that time, he does speak to those three uh, rather famous men who I mentioned, and all three of them write about their conversations. Mercer himself is also busy writing, another sign that he may not have been suffering from any sort of acute brain trauma. One of the things he writes is a letter to a friend in which he complains about a wound under his right arm, saying that this is the one, quote, that will soon do my business. <laughs> now, Mercer is a physician in his civilian life, just like Rush is, uh, as in addition to being an apothecary, which is essentially the 18th century equivalent to a pharmacist. Uh, and so Mercer probably knew his own body quite well. 
Uh, and indeed, it may be Mercer who's correct in that wound under his arm, which is a very warm part of the human body, hard to keep dry, hard to keep clean, probably got infected and did poor old Mercer in. Now, we'll never know for sure what killed Mercer, uh, but we sort of uh, will always chalk it up to wounds sustained during the battle. Now, I mentioned outside that these folks were Quakers. As a result, this house has an odd little bit of history to it uh, that you won't find in some other Revolutionary War field hospitals, and that is not only did the Clark family take care of American wounded, they also took care of the British. And so in the room right behind these folks right here was Captain John McPherson of the 17th Regiment of Foot. This is one of the jackets uh, that the 17th would have worn. McPherson had been struck through the chest with a musket ball, looked just like this. It perforated one, if not both, of his lungs. According to Dr. Rush, McPherson loses three quarters of his blood content. This man survives. Now, what makes that interesting is that in a day and age with no blood transfusions, no numbing agent, and no anesthetic, somehow a man with two collapsed lungs manages to live. Now, he'll get to go home to Scotland where he'll convalesce for the next ten years. Uh, afterward, he will, of course, die, probably from the wounds he sustained here at the Battle of Princeton. But McPherson's story always gives me that little hint of doubt I need uh, for Dr. Rush. For <laughs> somebody to, to lose that much blood and survive always just puts just one little niche in his reputation that makes me doubt uh, that it was the head injury that killed Mercer. Our third and final named uh, victim of the battle was Major Anthony Morris, Jr. He is the second son of the current mayor of Philadelphia in 1777. His older brother is here as well. On top of that, he's a Quaker. So he's a fighting Quaker, which makes him sort of a political and, and, and a, a social pariah for the people back in Philadelphia. That said, he serves his city and his new country well. He is shot in the kneecap, bayoneted in the neck, and takes a piece of grape shot to his abdomen. Uh, when he is brought here, he does not live long. He dies shortly after the battle and is taken over to the Quaker Cemetery where he is buried, just a two and a half minute walk from our front porch here. But because he is the son of the mayor, the body is exhumed and he is taken down to Philadelphia, where he still resides today, in the Quaker Cemetery in Old City. Now, those are our three named individuals. We do know, also, of an additional 12 amputations which took place here in the house, likely in the room where you're standing. I saw you shake your head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> here comes the fun part. Amputation is a life-saving method in the 18th century. Uh, as gruesome and terrible as it may seem, uh, this is going to be one of the ways you are going to save lives. Uh, now, at the onset of an injury, a doctor has to make a very difficult decision. And that is based on the concept of bacteria. Right? They don't have a name for it. They don't know where it comes from. But they do know some things about it. One, chiefly, that an untreated wound will become infected with what they don't know but it will become infected and kill the patient. They also know that the longer a inanimate object, some non-organic material, is left inside the body, the more likely it is to become infected and the faster it will become infected. And not only is that referring to broken pieces of bone and likely broken pieces of ball, it's also referring to the medical equipment they're going to use to extract it. So if a doctor sees somebody come in with a lot of broken material in their arm, they aren't going to take the 45 minutes to pull out every piece and stitch it back together, even if that limb is savable because of the amount of time that this would be inside the body. The longer this is in, the more likely you are to become infected. And so the answer is B. Remove the limb wholesale and remove the problem before it can become a problem. That starts with this. Any guesses? Tourniquet. tourniquet. I knew you would know. Somehow. <laughs> this is a tourniquet. It's what's known as a petit tourniquet, invented at the beginning of the 18th century. The petit tourniquet, invented by Jean-Louis Petit, is better known as a field tourniquet, or a screw tourniquet, uh, based on the screw uh, on the top of it. And of course, you apply pressure to the whatever afflicted wound uh, limb that you are going to either uh, remove or dissect. Uh, that is always the first step. The second step is my favorite step. 
<laughs> With no anesthetic and no numbing agent, a shot of the good stuff is all you get in the way of making sure your patient is somewhat comfortable. And I say a shot, and it's a little less of an exaggeration. You would get what's known as a jill, which is half a cup. And a jill of rum or a jill of whiskey would certainly be enough to put me on my butt. Uh, they would usually fortify it with gunpowder, uh, which, if you've never had rum and gunpowder, I have. It's not great, um, and I'm not sure how much more fortified I felt after the fact, uh, but that was a fairly common practice. What, what, why would they add the gunpowder? To fortify the body. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. It was meant to, you know, stiffen the blood. That said, the chief ingredient in gunpowder is, does anyone know? This would be a really good one. Sulfate. Uh, sulfur, uh, not magnesium. sulfate, it's sulfur. in there, right? Sulfur? Saltpeter. Saltpeter. Saltpeter and potassium chloride. The mixture for gun, gun powder. Uh, saltpeter is, of course, salty. Uh, so all it really does is make the rum a little tangy, uh, a little salty. Uh, I did not feel any more or less fortified. It did give me acid reflux. Um, <laughs> That said, it does make you relatively drunk relatively quickly, which makes the next step much less aggressive. This is what's known as a filleting knife. This side is not sharp, the sharp side you might imagine. Instead, the interior blade is the sharp side, and what they would do is cut two to three inches below where they were going to saw your arm off and peel back like you're filleting a fish. You would then peel back the skin, remove any viscera or muscle that you had cut through, and you were prepared for the bone saw. The bone saw is, of course, the, uh, the weapon of choice for any good surgeon to remove the limb. One, two, three cuts, and any man alive is mercifully unconscious. Do not believe the movies and TV shows where they're sitting around thrashing on the table. No human body could withstand that. Uh, and mercifully, the, your brain will shut you down to avoid having to feel that pain and endure that mental anguish. A minute to a minute and a half later, the limb is unceremoniously thrown out the window at Bob, and your arm has been removed. Then they would take an instrument like these. These small hooks are for pulling arteries and veins out of the detached limb, which they would literally sew together with little pieces of thread and replace back in the body. Then, with those two to three inches of skin you removed with your filleting knife, uh, filleting knife you would pull them back over to form the stump and sew it back together. You are limbless, but you have now have a much higher chance of surviving the wound you had in your arm. That said, you were the first person to have a limb amputated. Congratulations. 24 amputations later, and now it's your turn. And this has not really been sanitized. This has now cut through 24 people, and the best way that they've cleaned it is dunking it in a bucket of water that was nearby. Maybe they had some sort of rag with lard or some sort of... 18th century cleaning agent there, but sanitization in the 18th century is not what it is today. And so now, your 24 amputations later have a much higher chance of becoming infected than you did, which is why frequently in the 18th century you would find that if a gentleman had his limb amputated, you better pray that it's a low limb, because two to six weeks later you could be having the next step amputated as well because this, uh, this region had also become infected. Uh, that said, again, this is a life-saving measure in the 18th century. Uh, and as gruesome and as terrible as it seems, it did save more lives than it probably cost. Uh, and uh, although it would probably take a lot of people out of their profession, most were farmers, uh, it, uh, it certainly was uh, intended to save a life, uh, probably from a rather gruesome, sepsis-filled uh, death. After the battle, the house returns to what it was prior, a farmhouse. Uh, and from there, the Clark family would farm this land uh, until 1862, when it would be then sold to the Hale family. The Hale family got wise. They said, ooh, there was a battle fought down there on the other end of our property. And they opened that section of the field for the first time to the public is what was known as Battlefield Park. In 1942, the Hale family sells it off to the Smith family, and the Smith family had their eye on the prize, because less than four years later, they make the first of many deals with the state of New Jersey to sell the house and the farm and the Battlefield Park as Princeton Battlefield State Park. That said, it took them the better part of 20 years to finally contractually finish that agreement, and by the time the Smith family leaves in the late 60s, 
The state of New Jersey begins pumping in money to restore the house to its original look and feel as well as the land. The park and the house officially opened on July 4th, 1976 for the United States Bicentennial Celebration, and we've been open ever since. So, question. So, um, <clears throat> this was outfitted with plumbing and electricity and all yes, that. Yes, you just... may have noticed our forced air, which was not here in 1777, probably would have made Mercer stay a little more comfortable. Uh, but uh, yes, throughout the years, the house has been given indoor plumbing and indoor heating and air control and things like that. And it was operated as a farm? Mm -hmm. Right up until about 1942. When the Smith family bought it, the Hales and the Clarks combined had essentially farmed this place to exhaustion. Uh, and so there really wasn't any more farming to be done here. The Hales, or the Smiths, bought it with the intention of selling it to, to either the federal government or the state government. And what did they farm? Uh, at its peak, you would have had grains, so hay, uh, wheat, uh, and flax. Flax is their number one crop here, uh, and flax does not uh, have the same use uh, as it does today. Uh, and today we use it for like health food and stuff like that. But in the 18th century, they would have taken an instrument known as a fleam, which was essentially a stick with a bunch of nails sticking out of it, and scraped the stalks of flax until it became a substance known as tau, which sort of looks uh, like steel wool, but is much softer. That can then be spun and then woven into linen, oh, uh, uh, which is our chief crop, uh, or a, a textile here in the north. Uh, linen is a little thicker and less breathable than uh, uh, wool and certainly cotton, uh, which hasn't uh, gotten as big as it will in the coming uh, 100 years down in the south, but linen uh, is what much of our clothing is going to be made of. We did the family sleep when this was a field hospital? Upstairs, upstairs. So as you go upstairs, which you can in just a moment, you'll see that the stairs are rather wide, uh, and that's in large part because of an expansion done to the house where they added those two additional wings through the mid-1840s. The original stairs would have been very narrow, uh, and circular. So it's unlikely that they would have put any wounded soldiers upstairs. It was just simply not a place where anybody was going to be able to reach them. They needed to be down here so that they could be taken care of. So do you know what's still like original? Uh, you are standing on original floorboards. Okay. The sides of the walls and the ceilings have all been replastered, but their guts are all the same. The bones of this house have not changed in 250 years. Uh, as you look around, much of the larger furniture is period. It's from the time period. Some of it actually predates it. That china cabinet is 100 years older than our house. Uh, however, when the Clark family moves, they do exactly what you do when you move. They take everything with them. Uh, and so we don't really have anything left that belongs to the Clark family. Uh, now, go ahead and take a look around, and we're going to switch off. Yep. 